I'm Laura Flanders. From slavery to civil rights, how did African Americans survive repression and discrimination in this country? In a large part, it was through courage and cooperation, says the author of an exciting new book on the African American economic experience. From the earliest days to right now today, dispossessed African Americans pooled resources, shared skills, and did together for themselves what the segregated state would not. A conference coming up in Jackson, Mississippi, called Jackson Rising, hopes to revive some of this history with a view to stimulating a new wave of solidarity economics. Our next guest will be there with her brand new book, Collective Courage. She's an economist and associate professor at John Jay College. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Jessica Gordon Nempart to Grit TV. Jessica, congratulations. Thank you. So exciting, such an unbelievable treasure trove of stories. Can you remember when you first realized, oh my goodness, what a history here? Well, it's actually a long story because <laughs> I've been doing this for almost 15 years now. I started thinking about it because I was working actually with the Children's Defense Fund in Washington, D.C. We were trying to figure out family-friendly economic development policies, right, that satisfy all the sort of values of sharing and democracy and family supporting and all that kind of stuff. And I realized that a friend of mine had been working on Du Bois' philosophy about uh, cooperative economics. So I kind of gave him a call and he reminded me I could read his dissertation and then we talked and we decided to write an article about why cooperative economics would actually be a good economic strategy. He had started to think about it before. But he was thinking about it more on the theoretical side. And I realized we needed more of the practice, so I decided I should look and find out. So tell us some of the stories. Uh, some of the documents in your book go all the way back to slavery times. Right. So definitely for slavery, we're talking about informal cooperative economics, so not an official co-op business or something, but just collectively uh, raising money to buy somebody's freedom uh, so people would share, like one person might buy themselves out, then they would save money to buy their mother or their daughter or their wife or their father, or that kind of thing. So that kind of, that level of collectivity, people even consider the Underground Railroad to be a kind of collective activity, co sort of collective economics, sharing of resources, that kind of thing. But the more uh, official kind of relationships I found were what's called mutual aid societies. And that was around funerals and doctor's visits and yep. things like that? Yep. Health, uh, death, health, orphan, widows and orphans, that kind of thing. And basically it was you put in, everybody puts in a certain amount every year or every month, and then whoever needs it gets to take it out. So going forward, what's the next big chapter or moment that you look at in the book? Uh, organized labor, then, is the next group in the 1880s. So this is after the Civil War. We have a freed population. Um, and some of the unions, a lot of them are not including blacks because they don't want the competition. And they're also, many of them would be racist. But there are some that see that as long as the working class is divided, they're not going to make it. So Knights of Labor is my best example. Um, and for a 10-year period, they were doing integrated unions which were promoting co-ops, both worker co-ops and farm co-ops. Mm. And that's very interesting because in these days there's a, an assumption or a presumption that there's a distinction or there's a opposition between trade unions and, and co-ops. Or, or members of trade unions often say, well, why would I want to be part of a co-op? It's uh, right. wanting more work from me. What about the eight-hour day? Yeah, and it's a, it's a shame because for me, the histories that I found, they really were coexisted. They, they grew up together in a lot of ways. Um, it's going to come up again in the 30s, which uh, I still want to say something about Knights of Labor, but in the 30s, also the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which is the first black independent union. A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph, and never forget Helena Wilson, president of the Ladies Auxiliary. She and he together promoted co-ops, and she that was one of the major functions of the Ladies Auxiliary were to, was to talk about consumer education and co-ops because, again, keeping resources, money into working class hands, the um, Knights of Labor, they actually had to do a lot of their work underground clandestine. And in fact, even the integrated branches of the union had to have white leaders because blacks weren't accepted as leaders. So all the black 
basically members were black, but the leader would be white, and all the members would have to be underground because otherwise they could be lynched, mobbed, their co-ops burned, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. At every stage, and really every group in the world has done this, at every stage in history, they've needed co-ops to help, um, especially in marginalized cases where you're left out of the mainstream, to help you either create a living, do alternative work because you're not allowed in the mainstream work, that kind of thing. So throughout our history, the 30s during the Great Depression, um, with no jobs, no work, no money, no food, right? That was a huge proliferation. And then again, in the 60s and 70s would have been a huge proliferation for blacks because it was both the consciousness of that we need to do something for ourselves and also the actual economic need that we can't get the food we need, we can't do the kind of farming we want, we can't get the loans, right? So the co-ops really were providing food, loans, uh, work, health care, any of the things that they really either couldn't get or weren't getting adequately. Now you were kind enough to talk to me right before I took a trip to Jackson, Mississippi not so long ago for a story that's just out in Yes Magazine. And when I was there, I was lucky enough to interview um, people who'd been part of some of the co-ops that, right. you've, that you've <coughs> researched. The stories that they tell are so clear. Well, we were registering people to vote. The minute they registered to vote, they lost their jobs. What are we going to do? Right. We had farmers who joined the NAACP, never got another loan. What are we going to do? So the co-ops in some ways came first because they were helping people to farm to like if you had a co-op with a you had a joint tractor so you know if everybody couldn't afford a tractor five families or the whole church would share a tractor and then everybody would have a different day and you'd get the stuff done and then even the, the as you said the loans there were you know ways and lots of different communities have these sometimes they call them the susu or the revolving loan funds and that kind of thing but again if you can't get an outside loan you get loans together so we were already doing that kind of thing in the civil rights era, it not only became a necessity economically, but it became a necessity politically because, as you said, that people were telling you and it was happening all over the place. Anytime you tried to assert yourselves politically, so joining a civil rights organization, registering to vote, the plantation block, meaning the white landowners who were the old families who had been the, plant the masters in the enslavement periods, they would retaliate. And how did they retaliate? Well, many of the black farmers were actually sharecroppers. They didn't own the land they were farming. They were renters on the plantation blocks yeah. land. So what do you do if you're mad with somebody for registering to vote? You evict them. So they would register to vote by the time they got back home to their farm. All their stuff is out in the street and they don't have a farm anymore. They don't have a house. So what do you do? Well, if you have like Freedom Quilting Bee in Alberta, Alabama, Freedom Quilting Bee was actually women sharecroppers selling their quilts that they quilted in the winter, right? Making enough money to buy 23 acres of land to build the sewing factory so they could produce even more quilts. Well, once their families get evicted, where do they go? They go to the 23 acres of land that the co-op owns and start to reestablish them until they actually can mm -hmm. even maybe buy their own plot of land or we, we get another place to farm or that kind of thing. So you go through your book, th there's every famous name in black America. <laughs> Just about. Has, speaks out about co-ops. We've some mentioned point Dave Philip Randolph, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey in a way, certainly Fannie Lou Hamer, Absolutely. Ella Baker, yeah. all of them. Right, yeah. Why isn't this history better known? <laughs> well, that was my question, right? <laughs> what happened? I was trying to figure out what happened, and then when I started talking about it, everybody kept telling me black people don't do co-ops until I would lay out the story for them. Yeah, some hippie thing. Um, right, yeah, it's not, and black people don't, just don't do that, right? So seriously, but, what did happen? Well, you know, the best I can piece together was a variety of things. First thing is how dangerous it was, right? So doing alternative economics, as we keep saying, and that's partly the name of the, why I named the book, right? It was dangerous, especially in the South. You could get lynched, right? Burn, your stuff could get burned. You could get lynched. For why? Because you were being either too uppity by trying to do something on your own or because you were actually challenging the, the white economic structure, right? And you weren't supposed to do that. The white economic structure actually depended on all these blacks needing, right? Having to buy from the white store, having to, you know, rent from the white landowner, 
right? So they were going to lose out if you went and did something alternatively. And then they also lost power over you. And also, especially in the South, blacks in some counties were the majority. So the whites really couldn't, quote unquote, yeah. afford to let that happen. So there was fear of physical violence. There was also fear of red baiting, right? Right. Because of the McCarthy era, right? The fear of being called a communist. In fact, for African Americans, this, it was very serious consequences, again. Um, if you were considered a communist, you really couldn't work. Sometimes you were jailed, etc. So, and co-ops were considered sort of socialist communists. So there was that problem. But even greater, I would say, is the ideology problem. So it's not just the red baiting, but the ideology of capitalism was so pervasive, and blacks often really felt like they needed to be in the mainstream, otherwise they couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. Right. So we weren't taught about how to run a co-op or what a co-op was. We weren't taught about alternatives. So for people even thinking about what they would do, in some ways they had no models. They didn't know about the models. They were doing, they were practicing it, but they weren't talking about doing cooperative economics, especially in the 60s, because it, again, they felt it would be too divisive, both within the black community, because not everybody in the black community agreed with co-op development, and outside the black community, it was too dangerous to be seen as talking this commie stuff or whatever. So they wanted to stick to civil rights, political rights, what was in the Constitution, um, that's what they stuck to, especially in their public speeches. So even though everybody in their organization, people they knew, the local communities were all practicing co-op economics when they could, um, it wasn't talked about. Mm. But also remember, it was also dangerous, right. right? We still had in the 60s people being killed, not just for registering to vote, they were being killed for trying to do alternative economics sometimes. And lynchings had been going on for 100 years and part of that was people trying to do alternative economics and things so like that. So on the that. one hand, I want to ask you, what do you think the cost was of that kind of divorce for, between civil rights talk and constitutional rights talk and economic rights and co-op talk? Um, and then the other part of me wants to focus on the positive. Why do you think it's coming back now? Maybe you can answer both. <laughs> so I'll answer quickly about the divorce between the two, I think is the reason for why when I first started talking about this, everybody black I talked to said blacks don't do co-ops. We have that false history because no one would talk about it and people thought it was too dangerous to pass it down, right? So we all thought we couldn't do it. And then we got it hooked up to individualism. I still have people telling me, oh, I could never be in a co-op because I, I'm an individualist and I want, you know, my own money and this and that and, you know. Meanwhile, there's lots of people in co-ops who can still manage, in fact, they allow people, help man people to get some income and wealth and that kind of thing. So it has, I think, pl pl made a toll in terms of us not being able to easily get people to think about it. But the minute I start telling my stories and giving the history, everybody finds a relative, a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, an uncle who were involved, and so suddenly it resonates. So that's why we're able now, I think the movement is also moving again because people are seeing, oh yeah, somebody did do that before, oh I see how that could work, oh this makes a lot of sense, right? Especially now in the Great Recession, we're still in the Great Recession, so many people don't have a way out, they see this as something that can work. Today we have this Rising Jackson, uh, Jackson Rising conference coming on May 2nd, you'll be there. Um, I'll be there, I'm very excited about Tell people a little bit about, about what's it. happening in Jackson. We're talking about local, non-hierarchical ways that people um, cooperate economically. So it can be co-ops, it can be bartering, it can be any kind of unofficial, uh, informal ways to share or help each other out um, through, the, through the formal co-op ways. And um, Mayor Lumumba was really, his uh, whole plan was to really do a whole what we call co-op economy or co-op commonwealth in Jackson from having some of the municipal uh, enterprises become cooperatives to doing cooperative incubators so that more and more bus local businesses could be cooperatives as a way to address mm -hmm. un both unemployment and lack of services in Jackson. And uh, even though he's died, that momentum still seems to be going. And uh, the conference is really, one of the purposes of the conference is really to train people because they had this huge vision of starting all these co-ops in Jackson, they needed people trained. So we're having, I don't know, it's like 20 workshops on co-op 101, how to start a co-op, what is a co-op, that kind of thing. We have uh, the panel I'm on is more talking about what's the legacy and the history and where do we move from. Uh, we have people talking, we've got international people coming to talk about how they've used co-ops in the solidarity mm -hmm. economy in their lives. We're looking at other cities that have started to do co-op 
uh, development, particularly worker co-ops. It's going to be very exciting. Choke Mumba talked about making Jackson the Mondragon of the South. Yeah, it would Maybe be it'll incredible. Happen. Yeah, it'll be incredible. Thanks so much for coming in, Jessica. Oh, thank Congratulations. You. Thanks. How might worker-owned co-ops help build strong local economies that are good for everyone? Thanks to support from our viewers, Grid TV was able to attend Jackson Rising with Tessa, the toolbox for education and social action. Here's some of what we heard. Jackson Rising is, uh, I almost say, unfortunately unique because the, the thing that is happening in Jackson is so exciting. And the idea that you are, you're getting so many people from cross sector to really take control and say this is our community these are our lives this is our economy we are going to to raise jackson the main thing that, that people are straight up just interested in minus all the other abstract stuff job i need a job i need a stable job i need health care i need child care and i need it at a rate that's affordable if we can work together to figure that out i'm all in there's all these different formations that are trying to figure out how we start. And so the Southern Grassroots Economies Project is one of them. And that formation was born out of some work that happened at the U.S. Social Forum um, in Atlanta, Georgia in 07. And then there was a gathering held at Highlander, um, trying to bring people together who were doing work around economic alternatives. Um, and so that work really helped catapulted us to think about what is cooperative economics look like in the South and who's all doing that and how do we make sure that groups that are normally marginalized out of the conversation are in. First of all, a co-op, and I want to say this as strongly as possible, is a very competitive business. It is not kumbaya land. It is not committee land. It is not out there in some fantasy economy. It's in the real economy. It's lean without being mean. What co-ops do is they allow everybody to participate in the decision-making process, but you still respect the functional, uh, functional roles within a business. If you don't have access to the information um, about how the business is doing financially, and, and the training to understand how the business is working, is this actually what works in the, our enterprise, this is what works in our industry, then the me democracy isn't that meaningful. So the other critical piece is education and inf open information sharing. The people that have come here, not just from Jackson, not just from the South, but across the uh, United States and, and maybe wider, because people want to understand what's going on here, I believe, so they can emulate it in their own communities. Because it's that really that regional uh, development that I think is really important to developing a cooperative economy, because it is unique to every location. It is unique to their specific communities. So what are your assets in your community? And then how do you educate around that to understand your own cooperative economy? I first learned about cooperatives when I was here in the 1960s um, as a freedom marcher. Uh, and uh, one thing we came into contact with were the rural cooperatives that black people had uh, relied upon for some of their strength uh, in very difficult times. Demographically, I mean, Jackson is one of the poorest cities in, in, in the United States. Uh, and the poverty concentration is very extreme here. And it's a lot of black and working poor. Your average wages are probably like eight and below. Jackson's infrastructure is going to have to be entirely overhauled within the next 10 years by a federal mandate. So there's a lot, there's a ton of resources that are going to have to be spent. It wants to become a political question of who's going to get them, right? So the cooperatives was one of the things that we were strategically looking at when we, when I was working in the mayor's office, of how do we make sure that real these jobs go to Jacksonians and not just contracted out to every, you know, any and everybody. The co-ops and, and us being able to facilitate some of that from the from the city side was the most soundest means that we knew that we can devise and help facilitate producing. How many seeds can we plant so that you can see a complete cultural shift? Because even if we shift the policies, even if we shift and there's more technical assistance and cooperation Jackson happens, if we don't culturally shift and we culturally shift the people's minds to go, actually, this is mine, then it doesn't matter. Because then there'll be gains and then there'll be, there'll be rollbacks. So my goal long term is to have a cultural shift from people from an individualistic society to one of saying collective ownership. My goal is to actually have Jackson's risings in all the cities in this region. I think this is a moment that we cannot miss. And that's why it's so important 
that the labor movement understand that we must organize the South. You see Jackson Rising. You see the Moral Monday movement taking off around the South. You see the fast food workers movement spreading around the South. Workers in the South have had enough. They want change. They want hope. They want to believe that things can be different, and they can be if unions make lasting investments in the South. Coming back here to Jackson feels really great and empowering to me. Um, I was born only a few hundred miles from here. I was in another form of a cooperative, but it wasn't my cooperative, and it was called sharecropping. I come from sharecroppers, and we work someone else's land, and, and we did all of this, and they got all the profits, and they gave us little, little to next of nothing. I mean, even the house that we lived in wasn't our house, it was their house. Now that I'm back here, in the South, and now I have my own company, and it feels so great. It feels so good. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. It's one of the exasperating things about our not-so-United States. When white people in the north of the country protest inequality outside City Hall, it may take a while, but eventually they'll get noticed. Remember Occupy? When black people in the South, by contrast, organize for years, elect one of their own, and actually take over City Hall with a concrete plan, they can be in office for months without most Americans having heard of them. Which makes it particularly sad that Mayor Shokwe Lumumba of Jackson, Mississippi passed away this year before most people had any chance to hear what he was up to. Mayor Lumumba wasn't your run-of-the-mill mayor. He came up through the furnace of the 1960s as a defense attorney, a community organizer, and a founder of the Malcolm X grassroots movement. In our race-trained world, we'd call his ideology black power. And maybe that's why so few even in our progressive left media paid attention. But what do those words even mean? After years of civil rights laws, we've done away with legal apartheid. But we still live in a bitterly divided society in the U.S. Lumumba's goal was colored black and rooted in the blood-soaked Mississippi soil. But it was a vision of power, building some and then using it. Not to fit in, but to transform a flawed society. And wouldn't that have made it of interest to a whole lot of people? What made this moment ripe for change was the readiness of the people, Mayor Lumumba told me in one of his last interviews. His slogan was an old one, the people must decide. After a term on the city council, Lumumba's people organized their hearts out to elect him mayor, and he took office last year, not just talking about reducing poverty and inequality, but with an innovative plan to do just that, through public works carried out by local firms and government support for new, low barrier to entry, worker-owned businesses and cooperatives. What Lumumba called solidarity economics isn't a black thing or a white thing, it's a smart thing. Owned and managed by the workers, co-ops permit poor members to pool resources and share risk. They tend to provide higher wages and better benefits and create stability in their communities. Around the country, a whole lot of people wish their city officials would integrate worker-owned co-ops into their policies and plans. But Jackson under Lumumba was actually doing it. Will Lumumba's vision survive him? He'd be the first to say, the people must decide, but I bet they'd appreciate your support. There's something in Jackson's experiment that's good for everyone, black or white. It's a power thing. For The Laura Flanders Show, I'm Laura Flanders. <laughs>